Welcome to the week, everyone. I hope this uh, this day finds you in a good space. Today, I want to talk with you about the power of your voice and your path with the emphasis on your. You know, someone shared something that I wrote last week uh, about, I wrote an article that was basically about following your dreams. Don't forget to emphasize the your in your dreams because there's so many people out there who are following, they are working hard, they are building dreams, but it's not their dreams. It's it's somebody else's dream for them. And so I, I just kind of started thinking about how so many insights change if we put ourselves back into the equation and start emphasizing the your component. So instead of just follow your dreams, follow your dreams. Instead of find your voice, find your voice. Instead of walk your path, walk your path. And so I want to explore that with a couple of tweets. And actually, this week's tweets are not coming from me, but I'm going to riff on them. And um, let's dive right in. Let's talk about the power of your voice. This first tweet comes from Brother Stephen A. Hart. Uh, Stephen A. appeared on the Revolution of One podcast about a month ago. A really excellent story. I encourage you to give this brother a follow and uh, check out his Trailblazers podcast. A lot of great interviews there. Here's what he had to say. There are no unique messages, only unique messengers. The world needs you. You know, I see so many people hold themselves back from letting their ideas out, expressing themselves in the way they want to express themselves because they've bought into this narrative that says, well, this world is already filled with a bunch of influencers and a bunch of writers and a bunch of musicians and a bunch of coaches and a bunch of whatever, whatever it is you want to be. And I'm not very unique. I'm not about to say something that's never been said. And the market's so saturated with people who do this and who do that. You know, I think I'll just sit this one out. And the problem with that way of thinking is it makes being the best person to have done something the main reason for why you should do something. But what if the goal isn't to be the best? What if the goal is to serve people who will only receive it from you? Something that we often forget when we have conversations about finding your voice is that there are people in this world who need certain truths and they're only going to accept them or they're only going to entertain them based on the people that deliver it to them. You can never separate the message from the medium, no matter what the message is it's going to come through a human being in some kind of way. And whether you like it or not, human beings are human beings. Sometimes we make, make choices to listen or to not listen based on how somebody looks, based on somebody's style, based on how their voice sounds, based on how they dress, based on where they come from, based on what their political affiliation is, based on all sorts of things that we should and should not factor. And that means there are things you're going to want people to know. And the only way they may come to know those things is if they hear them from you. Brother Sean Dove talks about uh, the parable of the talents a lot and how we often have these talents and we bury them because we feel like, well, nobody really needs this. Nobody really cares. You know, I'm never going to be famous. But the question I want to ask you this week is what if the goal isn't to make history? What if the goal is to simply make an impact on the people that you have been called to serve? You know, we, we, um, there's a statement that your, your life will be the, the average or the outcome of the five most successful people or the five people you spend the most time around. And a lot of people hear that and they say, oh man, if I'm going to be somebody, I, I got to surround myself with a whole bunch of successful people. And there's good in that, right? You want to surround yourself with people that challenge you to get better, but an equally important thing is surrounding yourself with the people that you have been called to serve, whether they are successful or not, because that's where your blessings are. That's where your legacy is. And when you focus on who you are here to serve, rather than how can I be better than that person over there, you begin to tap into a joy and a fulfillment that comes from using your gift because you're not, you're not evaluating yourself in the same way that the world does. So a lot of people will talk about putting content out there or whatever it may be. They'll talk about it like, hey, you got to be super duper original. 
And, and a lot of those people are coming at it from the vantage point of, of you know, what it, what it takes to make a living or whatever. But before you even think about that stuff, you should be asking yourself, what makes me come alive when I do this? And obey that and trust that, knowing that if something makes you come alive, there's a reason for that. And put that out there. Yeah, you can work on the marketing stuff later if you care about it, but you might not even care about it. But regardless, whether you care about being famous or not, if you have something that you want to say or do, put it out there. Someone needs it. I remember back when I was in college, I was studying a lot of Christian apologetics. And, and Ravi Zacharias was one of my favorite writers at that time. And I remember every time I would read something by Ravi, I would get so excited and I would tell my friends, you got to go read this Ravi book. And I don't think I succeeded at more than one person. I had one friend, Sean Thunder Wallace, and him and I do the Thunder and TK show. And he was the only person that would actually listen to me. But I probably told dozens of people, you got to go read this Ravi book. And nobody ever listened to me. They didn't care. They didn't like it the way that I did. But when those people had questions about apologetics, they would come to me and they would ask me and I would say, but go read the Ravi book. He explains it better than me. And they'd be like, no, man, I want to hear it from you. They wanted to receive it from me. And there are people like that with you. And you are also like that with other people. So don't worry about making history. Don't worry about being the first person to have ever said something. Don't worry about all the thought leaders out there who are telling you, we don't need more noise. We don't need more mediocre writers. That's not what it's about. Yes, respect your craft, do the best that you can to get better. But what's the point of worrying about being better or being good if you aren't doing anything at all? You've got to do it first before you worry about doing it well. And doing it well is the product of just doing it and doing it with the confidence that someone out there needs the example that can uniquely come from you. All right, let's go to tweet number two. Tweet number two comes from none other than Mr. Isaac Morehouse. Isaac says, I have long wondered if the most unhealthy relationship is people's relationship to work. TK Coleman and I have discussed this a lot over the years. It seems people hate most of what work is, overlook what it can be, and ask of it things it can never give. You know, I believe that the greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world that work was his idea. I believe that work is not a product of the fall. I believe that work is a gift of creation. I don't believe that work is a curse. I believe that work is a blessing. I don't believe that work is something that we have to do. I believe that work is something that we get to do. And all of the reasons why it doesn't seem that way is not the result of work itself, but it's the result of distorted thinking about work. Most of us have never been taught to develop a philosophy of work. Did you ever take a course in school called the philosophy of work? Did you ever consciously, were you ever challenged to consciously think about what you should expect from work and what you shouldn't expect from work, what you want out of work, what role work plays in your life? Or were you just kind of taught to think of work as this thing that one day when you get old enough and your parents say, I'm not taking care of you anymore, you have to go get yourself a job. And so you don't even make a distinction between a job and work. Those two are the same thing to you because you've never thought about that. And you just kind of hope for the best. You need a philosophy of work. You need to think critically about the role that work plays in your life, the role that you want it to play, because work is not the sort of thing that you can afford to leave to chance. It's way too important. Too many of us subscribe to a story that says, all of the meaning in life comes from play. It comes from hobbies outside of work. And then work is this kind of thing that, you know, conflated with my job that I just got to do. And hopefully I can increase my tolerance of that so that it doesn't kill me. But what if all the meaning in life comes from work? So one thing I want to say about work is work is really nothing more than the investment or expenditure of energy towards a goal. And there are many things in life that we don't look like look at as work. We don't call it work, but it is work. Let's say you want to take a, a family vacation to Disney World. That takes a lot of work. You have to, to sit down and you have to coordinate with other people to decide what the good dates are. And by the way, if you've ever coordinated a, a trip, that's some serious work. Planning out the hotel, planning out how you're going to travel, planning out the budget, making sure everybody has the days off and the availability to do it, making sure that you jump through the hoops that you need to in order to be able to get the day off. All the decisions that you have to make in terms of money and time to be able to get this trip off the ground. 
then you either got to get in the car or get on the plane. You've got to pack. You've got to travel. You go to this place. You wait in long lines. You're doing a lot of work for that fun. But most people don't think of that as work. Why? Because they're not getting paid to do it. I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but there is something about being paid for our labor that makes it easier for us to subscribe to victim narratives about it. You know, well, I have to do this because I'm financially dependent on it. And if I stop doing it, well, the money dries up. So I have to do it. I don't really have a choice. And that's and it's really easy to kind of fall into that trap and get stuck in that cycle of thinking where you feel like you're a victim about work. But if you just set the money aside for a second and think of work as the as an investment or an expenditure of energy towards the achievement of a goal, life itself is work. There is nothing you are ever doing that isn't work. Even if you say, I'm going to sit down and watch a movie and I'm just going to flip through Netflix and see what I want to watch. Everything that you're doing, that is work. So the real question is, are you doing the kind of work that makes you come alive or not? And if you're not doing the kind of work that makes you come alive, are you doing the kind of work that will help you accumulate over time the knowledge and the skill set necessary to begin doing the work that makes you come alive? That is the work. The work is to do what, discover and do what makes you come alive. And, and if you haven't done that, the work is to figure out what you need to do to be able to do that. And no, you may not be able to get there overnight, but it is a work worth doing for the rest of your life because no matter what, you are going to be working. So two quick tips that I'll give to create a healthy relationship with work. Number one, never expect too much of your job and never expect too little of your job. So I, I use the example of let's take a marriage. Imagine a marriage where you expect your spouse to be everything. So in my marriage, for instance, my wife isn't really into basketball. Imagine if the success of our marriage or my happiness dependent on her feeling passionate about the NBA in the way that I do. I would be a miserable person, right? That would be expecting too much. That's what other friends are for. You know, it's okay to have interest that we don't share in common. In fact, that's what keeps things fresh and exciting. You need to have a world that you are bringing that person into. They need to have a world that you're that they're bringing you into. You need to have things that you're doing, people that you're hanging out with so that you can bring the, that fresh energy and those new experiences into the relationship. It's the same thing with work. Many people expect too much out of out of their job. Now I'm using the words as if they're saying. But one of the reasons why people have disempowered thinking about work is because they expect too much of their job. They treat their job like a spouse that is supposed to meet all of their needs. So if they're ever required to do a single task that doesn't make their soul leap, it kind of feels like I'm compromised, kind of feels like I'm selling out. And no, there are just other places that you are supposed to find fun in life apart from your job. And that's even for the people that say things like, hey, once you figure out what you love, you'll never work another day in your life. I don't think that's true at all. I get what people are trying to say, but that's not true at all. When you find your dream and you start doing things that you're passionate about, there are still going to be things that you need to do around that that won't always be fun. And that's OK, because your job isn't meant to be your everything. There are some forms of fun that you need to find outside of your job, not because you aren't creative enough, creative enough to come up with a dream job, but because no job is big enough to encompass all that you are as a human being. The second thing, though, is don't expect too little of your job. Imagine a marriage where, you know, you're afraid to ask your spouse out on a date or you're afraid to ever talk to your spouse because you feel like, well, it's just little old me. I don't know if that's the sort of thing I can expect. What? You would also have a miserable time because you're expecting too little. It's when you expect bigger and better things that you can become the kind of person who places demand on yourself. You place a demand on your environment and everyone gets better as a result of that. It's the same way with your job. Don't expect too little. Don't settle for anything less than this is work that is meaningful to me. I actually believe in what I'm doing. I feel good about what I'm doing. I feel like I'm serving a purpose that's just bigger than money. And even if I am doing this job for the money, I have a vision for how I am using that money as a tool to create other things that are meaningful to me. So don't expect too little of your job. Don't expect too, not, too much of your job. And above all else, 
think critically, think cautiously, think creatively about this thing that you call work. Don't leave it up to chance and don't just get your ideas from, you know, subconscious, you know, um, influences from what people are saying on social media. Form your own ideas about work just like anything else. All right, I wanna address some comments and tweets that came in in response to uh, the thoughts on work. All right, from AJC at AJC Abroad, a shout out to you. Work is an antidote for anxiety, an ointment for sorrow, and a doorway to possibility. Whatever our circumstances in life, my dear brethren, let us do the best we can and cultivate a reputation for excellence in all that we do. Elder Dieter, I don't know how to say that last name. I'm not even going to try, but you want to tell me on Twitter, I would appreciate it. Maybe I'll just Google it and listen myself. But uh, I what I really like about this is especially that last line, cultivate a reputation for excellence in all that we do. Sometimes we hold ourselves back from giving our best effort because we feel like our best effort is best reserved for doing our dream job. And so if we find ourselves doing things that aren't in the dream, it's kind of like a transition job. Well, I'm not really gonna do it with a sense of excellence because I'm just passing the time until I do what I really wanna do. But the fastest path to what you really wanna do is making excellence a habit wherever you are. There is nothing more powerful than sending a stronger, than sending a strong signal to the world around you that when you show up, you show up and you play the game of life out of pride and self-respect. No matter what you do, you're gonna do it with integrity, not because the job deserves your best, but because you deserve to express that which is highest within yourself at all times. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, this one comes from username blessed, empire uh, underscore crypto. Attachment to the outcome is suffering. Detachment to the outcome is pure joy. You're either the master of your mind or its slave. Work, prosper, create, but don't forget the creator. All right, all of this. So one thing I wanna say about attachment to the outcome is suffering. Some people hear that and they think, oh, well, I'm not supposed to care about anything. So if I have uh, desires, I'm supposed to suppress them. But there is nothing enlightened at all about suppressing your desires. That's not what detachment is. Um, detachment has nothing to do with saying, oh, my desires are bad. I have to pretend like I have them or make them go away or use meditation to purify myself of these dirty, filthy things called human needs. No, it's okay to want a glass of water and it's okay to enjoy laughter and good conversation. It's okay to have desires. Detachment, on the other hand, is about breaking unhealthy addictions that we have to mental images of what a happy and successful life looks like. No matter who you are, the reality that you live is always gonna be different from the fantasies and dreams that make you chase after that reality. And this is what a lot of people get at when they talk about learning to enjoy the journey. As you pursue the things you pursue in life, you don't pursue it from a place of emptiness, you pursue it from a place of abundance. You don't pursue it in order to become valuable, you pursue it because you are valuable and the pursuit is a way of expressing that already existing value. And when things don't turn out the way you expect, for better and for worse, you're not knocked, knocked off your horse for that because you understand the power of the journey and you understand that all things are for your self-actualization. I also like this part, you, you're either the master of your mind or its slave. Going back to what I said about thinking consciously and critically about your philosophy of work, if you don't do your own thinking, other people will do your thinking for you and you will become a slave to terrible ideas, terrible thoughts. So work, prosper, create, don't forget the creator. Don't forget the creator that is seeking to express himself dynamically through your work. Let's check out the next one. I've been reading every, this is from John Gutilla. I hope I said that right, John. Shout out to you, thanks for the comment. I've been reading Every Good Endeavor by Timothy Keller, and this is one of his pivotal points. It's such a freeing idea. So when I saw this tweet, John, I, I Googled Timothy Keller and I, I went to YouTube because before I buy a book, I like to go to YouTube and, and check out the author, maybe watch a few talks, listen to a few podcast interviews. You get a lot of good ideas there. And then if I wanna, go deeper, I'll, I'll pick up the book. And, and he told this uh, interesting story. 
he told he told the story of he, he well it was kind of like a um an anecdote he said imagine that you're at the bus stop and some guy randomly walks up to you and he tells you the name of a bird uh, the name of a duck in latin just some random information like that and while you're thinking to yourself why is this dude telling me random information he just walks off now your instinct might be to say okay i think this person is crazy but there's another possibility one possibility is yesterday someone who looked like you was having a conversation with that guy and told him that he was very interested in knowing what the latin name for a duck was and so the guy went and looked it up and then when he saw you he mistakenly thought it was the other guy and he was just walking up to you to give you the answer to the question that you asked him yesterday now his behavior makes perfect sense if that story is true Another possible story is maybe this guy is a spy and he is given a code word to say and he's given specific instructions about walking up to someone and saying that code word and the person who recognizes the code word will be his ally. Okay, so he was just testing you out to see if you recognize his code word and when you acted confused, he walked away. Now, all three of those stories make sense. And depending on which story you buy into, you're gonna have a completely different reaction. And what he says is the same is true of work. The reaction that we have to our work depends on the story that we're telling ourselves about work. Why are you working? Who are you working for? What is the real goal and purpose of work? All of those things, what role should money play? What role should personal fulfillment play? We're all telling a story about work. And that story is something that we can change. We can change that story by feeding ourselves new ideas and different perspectives. We can change that story by introducing more and more of our personal creativity into the situation. I look forward to interacting with Timothy Keller's work more. I do encourage you to um, check out the talk, Redefining Work, which I had a chance to look at right before hopping on. It's a pretty cool talk. So he's got some good ideas. I never heard of him. So thank you, John, for, for um turning me on to Timothy Keller. All right, let's go to the next one. This is from Sean Kennedy, AKA MacGyver. What's up, Sean? What greater way is there for us to be the image and likeness of God than to create and love? Lucifer's intellect is superior to ours, of course. To separate us from God, he attacks the root of what makes us children of God. Yeah, there's no greater way to lead people astray than to trick them into calling evil good and good evil. And that is something that has absolutely happened with work. And we have a culture where we are so afraid of being workaholics. We are so afraid of achieving success and then being dismissed as privileged. We are so afraid of failure. We're afraid of getting stuck. We're afraid of a lot of things. And these fears keep us from experiencing the beauty of what work could be work is so much bigger than these simplistic conceptions we have of just showing up to a job clocking in and clocking at clocking out and trading in five days of slavery so that we can hopefully get two days of freedom on the weekend yay saturday's here sunday's here and now i can actually live you know and kind of build up some energy before i go back to my depressing job on monday that's no way to live it's no way to live if your job is leaving you drained and depressed don't beat yourself up over it. Don't look at yourself as a failure for it. You got to do what you got to do for the time and stage that you're in. But know that that is a changeable reality. It's not changeable overnight. But if your job is leaving you drained and depressed all the time, that might be an indication that it's time to begin creating something new. And that may start at a very basic level, which is start asking some questions you haven't asked before. Start having some new conversations with the people around you. Start reading and listening to some different stuff. Start looking into some different places. Start expanding your sense of possibility because there's certainly more possible than that. All right, one more here. This is from Devin, who also shared a quote, set a goal and visualize how to achieve. This is a quote from the legend of Bagger Vance and it is spot on. So he shared with me this quote and I'll read it here from Bagger Vance. Put your eyes on Bob, put your eyes on Bobby Jones. Look at his practice swing, almost like he's searching for something, then he finds it. Watch how he settles himself 
right into the middle of it. Feel that focus. He got a lot of shots he could choose from, duffs and tops and skulls. There's only one shot that's in perfect harmony with the fella. One shot that's, that's in perfect harmony with the field. One shot that's his, authentic shot, and that shot is gonna choose him. There's a perfect shot out there trying to find each and every one of us. You know, so he's using a, uh, an example from golf where he's saying this guy can take a lot of different shots, but he's trying to get the feel for the right shot for him. And it's the same way when it comes to finding your voice and finding your path. There's no objective right or wrong about what you should write about or what job you should pursue or what career path you should go down. Those are the answers that has to come from you. But you can feel those answers in the form of a rhythm. You know, it's, it's about dancing to the rhythm of your true self. It's about finding the groove that is you. And you can feel when you lock in. And when you lock into that, when you find your voice, the way of speaking that resonates with your soul, so many of us think about, well, what do people want? What are people gonna buy? I'll tell you what they don't want. I'll tell you what they don't buy is somebody who's bored with themselves. Somebody who's showing up and talking and talking with the energy of somebody that ain't even interested in what they're talking about. The world ain't interested in that. If you want to be interesting, be interested. You want to be engaging, be engaged. You want to find your voice. You want to find your path. Don't start with what do people want. Start with what fires me up so much that I'm going to be willing to dedicate myself to that long enough to find a way to do it that begins to create value for other people. And once again, you don't have to make history. You just have to make an impact. And that's historical enough. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I will see you tomorrow on the Revolution live stream at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Peace out. Have a great week.